This morning, if you got your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, actually. Um, this morning, we're going to be partaking of communion, but not right now. Because I want us to talk about some of the things that we need to leave at the communion table. There are things in our lives that we need to clean up before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Communion is about sharing the bread in the fruit of the vine. It's the bread representing his body and the, and the, fruit, of the, the fruit of the vine representing his blood. But see, what we need to remember is what communion is not. It's not a means of salvation. There are some who feel by attending church every week, by doing good things, partaking of communion, tithing, and all of these things is kind of like a shoe into heaven. I've done all these things, so I'm good. But that's, that's false thinking. You see, because we have to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to confess our sins. We have to ask Jesus to come into our heart and life and, and transform us. But it's not a meaningless formal ceremony. Some people say, oh, i got to go to church this morning because it's the first Sunday of the month and we partake of communion, so I, I need to get there and I need to partake. It's, it's not Communion to me is a time of worship. It's exalting the Lord. It's, it's reminding me what he did prior to going to the cross for me. The Lord's table is a place, I believe, for us to leave some useless things. You say, useless things? Well, what could be useless? Well, I think we need to leave our guilt. Matter of fact, read with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. It says, For I received of the Lord that which I had also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord in an unworthily manner, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man be hungry, let him eat at home, that ye may not, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Lord, you have given us so much. Lord, your words are inspirational. And Father, you give us direction. But Lord, I pray this morning that we take heed to your words. And Father, that we do that which you've commanded us to do. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. So I was saying there this morning that we should... Leave all of our guilt. Communion does not save. 
But these symbols speak of salvation. Communion is evangelistic. A good time to come to faith in Christ. You see, I believe that when we start thinking of communion, we start thinking about what communion begins to mean to us, I think we really need to stop and we need to start examining our life and saying, where are we in the Lord Jesus Christ? What's going on in my life? Where, what, is, what is upside down that needs to be turned right side up? A time of heart searching for believers. A time to confess our sin. What does John tell us in 1 John 1, 9? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me ask you this morning, how many of you this morning can say, well, you know what? I prayed and I know that the Lord has forgiven me. I know that the Lord has taken these sins that I have committed and, and I've, I've, I've asked him to change me. You see, if God has forgiven our sins, let me, say, let me, let me rephrase that. If God has forgiven us of our sins because of Christ's death, then why must we confess our sins? Because we each have to give an account. I think when we start recognizing and we start confessing our sins, we start realizing how wrong we are about the things that we do. We become aware of our relationship with Christ and how, how we need to make sure that things are right with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and admitting our sins and receiving Christ, we're what? We're being cleansed. We're agreeing with God that we truly have sinned and that we'll turn from it. You see, when we confess our sins, we're supposed to turn from those things. We're supposed to do a U-turn. I was talking to somebody this week, and somebody would know who I'm talking about, and I was talking with him on the phone, and he had called to ask me a couple questions, and I asked how he was doing, and he said he was doing fine. And I said, uh, everything good in your house? He said, yeah. I said, no, no, not your house house. I'm talking about your body house. Everything good in your life? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's real good. I said, confess your sins. Oh, I haven't sinned lately. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Let me hang up the phone. I think I got the wrong number. <laughs> he said, Pastor, I asked the Lord to save me a long time ago, and he did. I said, well, that's great. I said, but, you know, when you ask Jesus to forgive you, you've got you to change your whole life. Everything about you has to change. Well, once you ask Jesus into your heart, that's all you got to do. You're good from there on out. I was like, oh, we're still on that same boat. And I said, that's, that's not exactly true. I said, you can't ask Jesus into your heart and continue to live in sin. It doesn't work like that. Well, yeah, Pastor, the Word says just, just call upon the Lord and you're saved. I said, I understand that, but you, you call upon the Lord and you're saved, but you have to allow the Holy Spirit to change your life. Well, my life is fine just the way it is, I think. And I thought, oh, you know why? And then they, that scripture come rushing back to my mind, why cast your pearls before the swine? And I'm like, but he's gotta have, there's got to be some hope here. There's got to be, you ever felt that way? You ever felt like you, you, you keep reaching out to a person over and over and over, but there's not really any change? You want to help somebody and you, you want to lead them to Christ and they keep telling you that, well, but, but the Quran says this. Or, the Buddhists, they'll, they'll come at you with another angle. and The Mormons will come at you at another angle. and The Jehovah's Witness, they'll come at you at another angle. Everybody wants to be right. But I'm telling you, church, there's only one right. And that's confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Matter of fact, the scripture is so very, very poignant. There's no way to heaven but except through Jesus Christ, period. And you can't, 
Some people just don't want to hear that. And then when you get other pastors or people on TV that say there are multiple paths to heaven, I, I immediately go to the scriptures and I'm like, is it possible? Is it possible there are multiple paths? But I just keep coming up to this one passage. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And only a few will find it. But wide is the road that leads to destruction. And many will travel that road. Church, two roads, two directions. And guess what? They're both one-way streets. Neither one of them have a U-turn sign on them. Either you believe or you don't. You know, and it breaks my heart because a lot of times I I, I try to reach out to my family and and I try to explain to them about Christ and some of them will say, you're judging me. Or if I'm talking to somebody at work, they'll say, you're judging me. I say, I'm not judging you. The Word of God says you'll know them by their fruits. I was talking to a young man who goes to a well-known church. And some explicitives came out of his mouth this week. I was shocked. Let me just put this. I was more than shocked. I was embarrassed. And if you're a grown adult, you don't embarrass easy, right? Come on, we've, we've been down those roads. We've heard people speak that language. But when it's a young person who talks to you about his church on Monday morning and by Friday these words are flying, I was like, so I just simply said, hey, does the pastor talk like that in the pulpit on Sunday? Well, no, what kind of question is that? I said, well, I don't know because, I mean, you talk about how great he is, but then I hear what you're speaking and The two just, they don't jive. They don't don't go together. You see, church, we have to live what we walk. You know what I'm saying? We believe the Word of God, we have to live the Word of God. If we believe the Word of God, we must walk the Word of God. Everything about our lives must speak Jesus. No exceptions. Because... Our time is short. I don't know about you, but I'm getting old. Older. My biological clock is ticking. I know some of the ladies use that term and when they talk about having babies. But all of us have a biological clock. As we get older, the older we get, the closer we get to The dirt. I know that's not something you wanted to hear this morning, but that's the truth. It's the truth. I used to tell young people I'm closer to the dirt than they are, but you know what I've come to find out? Do you know that there are more young people dying today than there are older people dying? Because of drugs and wild living? It's terrible. They say this fentanyl crisis that we've got going on in America is unparalleled to anything we've ever faced before. I was talking to a young man who works for the fire department. And he was telling me about the certain part of the county that he worked in. And a neighbor called the police because this person had a lot of trees in his yard, and there was this file odor in the yard, stench like unbelievable. So they called the fire department, the fire department go in the backyard, and here there was this young man who had OD'd on drugs, who was sitting up in a tree and had died there. Church, we're living in a day and an age where people need to hear about Jesus Christ. We live in a day and age. We can't hold back. We need to start delivering God's word and confessing our sins. What We are free from guilt. 
So we need to leave our guilt at the table. Sometimes we feel guilty because we hear of a friend or a, a person who's died and, and, and we couldn't get them. We couldn't get to them in time. We, they, they wouldn't hear us. They wouldn't receive the word. And sometimes we feel like that's our fault. But the enemy is alive and he's active. He comes to rob, kill, and destroy. He's going to do his best to keep them from you. We need to leave our grudges, all your grudges. You need to leave those at the community table. We're celebrating forgiveness. His death has purchased our forgiveness. We receive this forgiveness, what? By faith. You see, the world thinks we're crazy because we're receiving things by faith. None of us have seen Christ face to face. None of us have lived the word of God that the word of God tells us about. You know, Jonah and the whale. Man, that guy was on a boat and out to sea. Waves got rough. Everybody got concerned, started throwing things overboard. And finally they figured, hey, somebody must have sinned. So they started questioning one another. And next thing you know, Jonah's bound for the water. Before his feet can get wet, whoosh, he was swallowed up by a whale. And the seas got really smooth. He was in the belly of that fish for three days. He must not have tasted good. Because you see that whale, he swam up the shore and he threw him up. He came out with all the seaweed and all the slime and all the stuff that had built up in the whale. Of this, and there he was. He's, now he's going to Nineveh, where he didn't want to go. You see, sometimes we have grudges because God is sending us places we don't want to go. We want to do this direction. God wants us to do this direction. And so we get upset with God because that's not a part of our plan. Well, I'll show them. I just won't go. And then other things start happening. Other things start transpiring because we are holding a grudge against the wrong person. We need to, we need to take care. If anybody had a right to hold a grudge, it would have been Jesus Christ. But what does he say in Luke 23, 34? And Jesus said to the Father, what? Forgive them for they know not what they do. Think about that for a minute. Jesus, the Son of God, on the cross, nailed to the cross, a crown of thorns in his head, blood coming down his face, blood pouring out of his body. And here he is saying to the Father, forgive them. If anybody had a right to hold a grudge, it was him. Now, I'm human. Had I been on the cross, I'd have probably said, Jesus, Send down some lightning and fry them. I want to see them burn. No, but that was not Jesus. Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We have never wronged as he has been wronged. We've never been wronged like that. No one I know in this room has, has even suffered like Jesus has suffered. But yet when we go through a little trial, a little tribulation, we get upset and we're like, Jesus, why are you doing this to me? I don't understand. What, what's God got against me? And it's not God at all. He forgave his crucifiers. Why? So we could learn to forgive. When we think of that moment, and I think of that moment when I read that passage over and over and he says, forgive them. How could I not forgive somebody who has wronged me? They didn't nail me to a cross. They didn't put a crown of thorns on my head. They didn't beat me with a whip. So how can I not forgive? I think we need to leave our bitterness. There are people with a lot of bitterness in this world. And I think the message here is <coughs> that the cross can remove bitterness. 
No bitterness in Christ despite his suffering. We've been given examples of Jesus given by Peter in 1 Peter 19 through 25. For this is thankworthy. If man, if a man for who is conscious toward God endure grief, suffer wrongfully, for what glory is it if when he be buffeted for your faults? Ye shall take it. But if he do well and he don't suffer, what? You see what I'm saying? Things can change in our life. And so we need to understand bitterness should not be a part of our life. Bitterness should be something that we turn over to the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we be bitter when he endured such pain? Focusing on Jesus can cause us to what? Forgive. But bitterness, I tell people bitterness is like a little cancer. And it just keeps festering and festering and festering. And next thing you know, I hear people say, well, pastor, I'd forgive him, but you have no idea how he treated me. Oh, pastor, I'd forgive him, but, you know, I needed help. And they, they just turned their back on me. And they call themselves Christian. They wouldn't even lift a penny to, to help me to get a, a drink of water. They wouldn't, they wouldn't lift a, a hand to help me move something out of my way. They wouldn't do anything. And we become bitter toward people. But I'm telling you, bitterness is just something that destroys your walk with God. Bitterness can destroy all that you have. You know, I can't help but think about when I read the scripture when it says to be joyous in all occasions, in all situations. I can say that this morning because when I went to therapy this week, the therapist made me cry. She was not compassionate. And the whole time I was hurting, she was smiling. She was considering it all joy. It was not joyful. I told her, I said, I don't like physical therapy. She said, no, you come to PT. She's an Asian lady. You came to PT. And I said, I know physical therapy, but I don't think a massage is a part of physical therapy. She said, no, PT means pain and torture. <laughs> and so I'm giving you pain and torturing you because I can't do this to my husband. So I took this job. Wow. When do I see her husband? <laughs> but listen, bitterness. I, I've heard people say over time, bitterness is kind of the root of all evil, but bitterness is not the root of all evil. Sinfulness is the root of evil. I think we need to leave our burdens at the table. See, Jesus cared enough to die for us. He cares enough to keep us day by day. The cross proves his love over and over and over. See, we have to trust him to take away of our anxieties. We have to trust him with our cares. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your cares upon me. See, not some, not a few, but all. See, some people want to hold on to some of those burdens. Well, you know, God didn't do that, so I really can't give that over to him. I caused this on myself. He knows that. He knows that where, where all these burdens were caused by. But I'm telling you, church, we need to understand this, that we need to cast all of our cares upon him. We need to give him everything. Don't hold back. When you give your burdens over to the Lord, leave them there. Don't say, well, in a couple days, 
If it's not resolved, I'll pick it back up and I'll try to solve it myself because we're so much in the habit of doing that, aren't we? We do that. We pick it back up because we haven't gotten the answer that we want. So we pick the burden back up and say, well, God didn't have time for that one, so I'll have to work this out myself. No, we have to leave them there. That's all a part of trust. That's all a part of faith. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How many have stepped out in faith this week? What do you mean, Pastor? Just that simple. How many stepped out in faith this week and said, you know what, I'm going to do something I haven't done before. So I'm going to step out in faith. And I'm going to trust God with it. See, we have to step out in faith. We have to trust God with what we're doing. See, if God told you to do something, do it. Don't say, well, you know what, let me figure out how I'm going to do it. If you step out in faith and do what God tells you to do, you don't have to worry about it going south. Because he's got you. He's directing you. He's leading you. It's when we take those blinders off and we begin to try to see the whole picture, the big picture, then we become a little nervous, a little scared. We have to step out in faith. The disciples had to step out in faith. Because when Jesus went to the cross, guess who they didn't have? Walking with them. In the physical form, Jesus. But what they had was the power of the Holy Ghost who went before them and went with them and with the authority and with the power that Jesus had given to them to move forward. Their faith was they needed to trust. And thus the world began to grow in Christ. When we partake of communion, communion needs to be meaningful to us. The Lord's table is is like a great bridge spanning the entire interval of the church history on earth. One end rests on the shame of the cross and the other is planted in the glory of the kingdom. This feast sustains us. It's a threefold relationship, if you will, to the Christian. It is a reminder of our past justification. It is a reminder of our present sustenance in our new life. And it is a pledge of our future blessedness and glory. You see, when we begin to examine the Lord's table, we begin to look at that. We begin to see the vastness. We begin to see the overall picture of what Jesus was talking about when it came to the communion table. We understand that he loved us so much that when he sat with those disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And he supped the cup and he said, this is a New Testament in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. You see, Jesus wasn't jumping ship on us. He was helping us to understand that he's coming back. He's helping us to understand where we are headed. But he says in verse 34, <coughs> And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So when we begin to think about communion, he says, what does he say? Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The evangelistic part of that is he's coming again. He's going to set all things in order when he comes again. That should be a shout and a hallelujah, amen, because he's coming back. 
And when he comes, guess what? He's taking us to where he is. In the twinkling of an eye, think of that for a moment. Lynn, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to depart from this earth. And we're going to be in the presence of Almighty God. When we begin to think about all of the heavenlies, all of those who have gone on before us, who are sitting at the feet of Jesus, casting their crowns at his feet, and singing hallelujah. I can only think here on earth when I think of all that must be taking place in heaven. All of the beauty and all of the splendor and all of the glory in which it beholds. I begin to think, how come I can't go now? I want to go now. I don't want to miss out on any more. But there is an appropriate time for each one of us. You know what? Jesus may show up right after service. And that's going to be your, your appointed and appropriate time. It may be next week. We don't know. I just know this, that when I think of communion, I think of my time that I get to spend with him. So this morning as we serve you, I'm going to ask that everybody just hold theirs steady until we've all been served and then we will all partake together.